This is the Dean, the Dean Show. This is the Dean Show. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum, peace be unto you. Welcome to another episode of the Dean Show. My next guest, his life was like an action-packed thriller. You don't have to turn on Tony Montana, Scarface. We got everything here from his life. We're going to try to uncover why this man left that life, that life of chasing desires and passions in the whole material world and be, being a slave to that, to being a slave to something else. All this and more here on The Dean Show with my next guest, Mujahid Fletcher, here on The Dean Show. We'll be right back. This is The Dean, The Dean Show. This is The Dean Show. This is The Dean, this is The Dean. This is the Dean Show. 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 Assalamu alaikum. Peace be unto you. Wa alaikum salam. Peace be unto you. How are you? Hyman? Good. Great. Jaime. Jaime. Yes. Mr. J? Yes. That's what they used to call you? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? Alhamdulillah. I'm great. All praises be to Allah. I am great. Yeah, you, you're doing some wonderful work out there. By the blessings of God, I mean, you know, I'm just thankful to be able to even be alive and, you know, do whatever good I can. Now, now you just said something interesting. You, you, you're thankful to be alive. Because you've had some situations that you almost didn't make it out alive. Is this right? Right. Yeah, so this is what we want to talk about. We want to talk about your life before you accepted this way of life. The way of life of all the messengers of God. That way of total and complete submission to the one God. Doing God's thing, not your own thing. Doing God's will, not your desires. So you were a person, like many, in a state of confusion. Lost out there in darkness. And now you're someone who has peace. And you're a slave, not to your passion and desires, but you're a slave to the one who created you. And you can identify with a lot of the other youth and other individuals, adults too, who are still stuck in that lifestyle of chasing the passions, desires, working from Monday to Friday, party, party, work, work, and, you know, gangs, drugs, throwing up this hand gesture, shooting here, shooting there. And your life, like I mentioned, was like the life of Tony Montana. He was Colombian too, right? He was Cuban, actually. Cuban, okay. <laughs> so, Same difference. <laughs> yeah. So, but you're Colombian. Right, Colombian. Yeah. Well, talk to us a little bit. Open up. Tell us, how was your life before Islam? <clears throat> um, I came to America uh, when I was eight years old. And my parents came from Colombia. And I, and I have to start by saying my parents, you know, I'd, I'd never known of them to drink or smoke uh, in their life. Uh, my father was an agriculture engineer and you know educated and the background from from Colombia is very strong family oriented so when we came to America we thought all these good values that we had from our culture would amplify and obviously many people come to America and migrate because of better opportunities um, when I was eight obviously I didn't even know English so I came as many of the immigrant uh, you know kids that that come went through ESL English as a second language and trying to identify and understand the culture here of all the different cultures together um, was challenging. I mean, I had a, you know, a culture shock. Uh, things were done more individualistic here uh, in America. You're kind of on your own and, you know, you, you basically handle what you have to handle on your own. But in Colombia, everything was done collectively, um, even in school, you know, in elementary school. So when I grew up and it was about the age of 12, 13, certain movies started coming out. Uh, like New Jack City, Boys in the Hood, Menace to Society. And for anyone who knows about these films, I mean, they're in an urban setting, basically, in, in some of them in L.A. or New York. And it was uh, basically the lifestyle of gangster lifestyle. Uh, it was all about drug dealing and being close to your friends to the point that if somebody had a problem with them, you would protect one another. So you're being in an environment where... <clears throat> you are a majority either african-american or latino which is the public school that i was going to uh, this movie new jack city wesley snipes being african-american uh, you know portrayed the life of a drug dealer and made some sort of gang 
and in front of my eyes in school I saw a gang form and they named it off of the uh, film so it was called New Jack Hustlers New Jack Hustlers? Yeah, and so the movie's called New Jack City, they called it the New Jack Hustlers at the beginning it was just like you know anything you know I'm 13 years old and uh, before we knew it though Latinos when they used to go to the restroom we would hear stories that you know five African Americans beat him up for no reason just because he's Latino mm -hmm. so it became really hostile the whole environment and uh, a lot of these people from this gang actually lived in my apartment complex and we used to have to walk to school you know we didn't have a bus going to school so these people were either behind us or in front of us every day so as more Latinos uh, began uh, being re disrespected. You know, some, so, some day somebody walked up to a Latino and just spit on his face. Mm -hmm. And uh, somebody else went and slapped a guy. And I was like, you know, you know what, what's this about? You know, so I, I mean, my father always taught me to respect people, but also make myself respected. And so I used to always think, I mean, I hope they don't come my direction. I mean, my dad taught me how to box when I was young. Were you, were you in a gang at this time? No, no, no. This is the foreman of the environment of a gang. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because I never thought that we would be anywhere close to a gang. But what happened was when more Latinos began, uh, you know, being violated, you know, and assaulted, uh, a lot of Latinos came together and they said, well, we have to protect one another. And, um, and it made sense. You know, and uh, we kind of started getting together. And whenever we were like 10 or 20, then these guys wouldn't do anything. And uh, all of a sudden, I realized that it was, it was dangerous being by yourself. Because then if they caught you by yourself, uh, it was something called caught, being caught slipping. Meaning that they could just lynch you out of 5, 10 people. So then it had to become official that you actually had each other's backs or protected each other. So we came with a name called La Familia or The Family. Because, you know, as Latinos, you're from Mexico, Colombia, Puerto Rico, Cuba, and you're all different as Latinos. So we had to get together on commonalities. And so we called this La Familia, and before we knew it, it became a gang itself. And um, because of my determination of having some justice, let's say, of people not violating one another, and me being stern about that, they asked me to be the leader of this gang and uh, started initiating people. I mean, you know, beating people down to come into the gang making people be able to be upright with what they said. Don't get me wrong, it's a lot of good values, right? Loyalty, uh, keeping to your word, you know, uh, you know, brotherhood. A lot of things that, that tied us together is just basic human values that everybody cherishes. Give us an example when you said violated in, when you get violated in, is that what it is? Um, what, what happens? Now somebody comes to you and says, look, I want to be a part of this uh, La Familia. La, can you say Cosa Nostra? <laughs> La Costa Nostra. <laughs> is that same thing, family? So, it's something like that, something right? Like that. So right. I want to be a part of this La Familia. I want to be a part of this clique, this organization. <laughs> what, do you, what do I got to do to get in? Well, you know, usually people would do it for protection. For protection? At the beginning, it was like a necessity. But then at that age, you know, 13, 14, 15 year old kids, you know, being in a middle school, it starts becoming like a fad. Yeah. <clears throat> Who are you with? Yeah. Right. And so whenever we know that we can be respected wherever we walk, uh, then people want to be that way. Yeah. And so they would come and they said, you know, we want to uh, be, be down, basically. We want to be part of the gang. So you make them do a few jumping jacks? Or no. Of, what, what do you make them do? <laughs> the, the issue is there's a weeding out process because if they just want to come in because they want to act cool, then those need to be weeded out. This yeah. is not about being cool. It's about, you know, having loyalty and respect and all these principles. So in order for them to prove themselves, then they're initiated. An initiation is basically about two, uh, two minutes. Two minutes. You know, of uh, three of us basically beating him up. Yeah. And people actually go through that and now you feel part of this family. This is your family. This is now you're part of something. <clears throat> you got the protection. You got your brothers. And Pretty much. I mean, this is, a, you know, a false, uh, you know, false sense of a false sense of, false sense of security, everything yeah. based, based on false sense of security. But that's what happens in that realm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I remember, uh, you know, being chased by 10 guys, right, running in my house and my parents sitting there like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, there's 10 guys outside want to beat me up. Right. And uh, and you know, my father couldn't even understand this. Yeah. And it's funny because from Colombia, he'd walk out in front of the 10 guys and be like, oh, it's 10 of y'all. Just one. One. Y'all want to fight him? It's just one. And he used to say, well, you know, make them respect you 
because he knew the sort of environment we were living in. I mean, people were, you know, began dealing with guns. There was uh, gunshots. I mean, one of my friend's houses, <clears throat> you know, they drove by and they did a drive by in his house, almost shot his, you know, little uh, sister, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, many things were, were crucial. I mean, it was, it was life and death. Uh, you know, having guns at the, you know, at the age of 13 and 14 is something that was a, a sense of security even to protect yourself and your family. So we got guns and, involved now. Yeah. Knives, I mean, guns. Guns, you know, knives. Brass knuckles. Uh, that, that, that popped up here and there, <laughs> but it wasn't even respected really. Yeah. It was about, you know, the majority of it was about being real and being yourself. Yeah. Okay. And that's attractive for a lot of people because a lot of people act like someone who they're not, especially yeah. at that age. So whenever you know who you, who you are and you can, you know, try to make yourself respected and if somebody wants to violate you and you have enough, uh, what can I say, strength, you know, to, to tell them, well, step outside and we'll handle it and all that. It's that sort of environment. But it's funny because it all started from the films and the music. I mean, gangsta rap. M music, gangsta rap. Gangsta rap, NWA. I mean, uh, you know, yeah. back in the days and, you know, Ice Cube, I mean, Easy e Dr. Dre, Snoop, all of these names that later on became, uh, you know, ent entrepreneurs, I mean, multimillionaires, you know. Uh, they basically began around the time that we were growing up. So this whole hip hop culture formed and we were part of that beginning phase basically. Did you have a certain hand sign signal that you guys would do? You know, it's funny. I never, I didn't like that stuff. Yeah. You know, I, I didn't like, I didn't like people kind of hyping things up as if it was a game. Mm -hmm. I always thought it was, it was serious, you know. Um, it was, it was not about flashing and, you know, acting like someone who you were, who you mm -hmm. weren't. So I used to realize, like when friends of mine had a problem, sometimes they were like somewhere in public and they used to call me and say, man, look, you know, so-and-so is over here. And they had a problem with somebody's like five, ten guys and he's by himself. So I used to be the sort of person that used to go and, uh, and walk them out of a public place, mm -hmm. you know, for protection sort of deal. Yeah. No time for all these, you know, signs and everything. But yeah, some of them, you know, they're like artists. Yeah. They draw up things and, you know, start giving, you know, signals and signs, which actually for me, I thought it was just uh, leaving traces, you know, of evidence yeah. <laughs> and yeah. for later on for them to coin you and yeah. signal you out, you know, which yeah. eventually became that. Yeah. They had a book of us with a sort of, you know, outline of who was who and the sort of signals that, that were, uh, you know, attached to who we were yeah. and so on. We're just getting started. We got a lot more. So stay tuned. We'll be right back with more with Majahid Fletcher here on The Dean Show. And if we're going to worship something, I figured I might as well worship the creator instead of any of the creations. Now, in, upon investigating all the religions, I remember finding out the meaning of what Islam is, what a Muslim is. Those who surrender their self to God is a Muslim. Those who surrender, submit to God, God's will. That is it. Islam was pure. It was just, you just pray to God, your creator. Back here on The Dean Show with Mujahid Fletcher talking about the past so hopefully people in the present can benefit and change for the better. So along with this lifestyle, this tough lifestyle, you got partying. Oh yeah, drugs, I mean, partying, yeah. You know, right. substance abuse. Substance abuse, right. So, you know, is there, is there any happiness there? Is there anything? Because we, we really want to connect with those who are still in this type of lifestyle. Right. They say, you know what? These people, they don't identify. This is my family, man. These are people, these are my homeboys. Right. And, you know, uh, this is all I got. And that, like you said, that false sense of belonging, or false sense of security. Right. So when you come across someone, because you've been there, you've done that, and you, you deal with someone who's still chasing that, that false sense of security, how do you deal with them? <clears throat> First and foremost, I think, um, you know, as human beings, we're a product of our environment. I never really thought of one day like, oh, I want to, you know, start a gang. 
it even happened without us even considering or understanding it, right? It was a reaction to our environment. That's first and foremost. Um, whenever, whenever movies come out, uh, even though people think it's art, it can become reality. Okay, so a lot of people, and nowadays when I'm dealing with people, you know, they have a sense of being like someone else because they're scared to be themselves because they don't, they have an identity issue. And that's just because of the environment that's stimulating them to be all kinds of other things. Okay, so um, nowadays when I deal with someone, first and foremost, I like to respect where they're at instead of downplaying where they're at. That's the first thing, especially for someone in, in gang culture or even youth in general or someone who has a false sense of security of who they are. Because the worst thing to do, and you know, we fail to do this as parents many times, is consider that even though we may want you know, our youth or, or someone to be in a certain point, we don't talk to them as if they're there already. We have to talk to them based on where they're at. So whenever I deal with uh, people, and I'm dealing with a youth right now, I mean, he's 15 years old and he's part of a gang you know, here in Houston. Uh, First and foremost, I have to respect the fact that he's made a choice. Uh, but then for him to consciously understand the repercussions. And all I can offer is some advice based on, you know, experience and certain people who took that path and where it leads them. Now it's on to them, you know, who they want to follow and what they want to do. But giving people choices and options based on experience, I think is very valuable. Before when we were growing up, we didn't have people that were older than us that could actually connect to us you know, with our reality and be able to speak to us at that level. So it was always downplaying. It's like, y'all shouldn't do this. What do y'all do that? And whenever you're young and you hear that, you're like, yeah, yeah, you don't understand me. You don't understand where I'm coming from, which makes you isolate yourself. And the only people who understand you are your friends. So that becomes your family, basically, you know, sadly enough. Tell us now, did you see anybody living that lifestyle or you living that lifestyle was there always something missing in the back of your mind saying, you know what, I got to change, I got to get out? Was, was there something eating away at your conscious? Most definite. Every single one of us uh, felt that. Uh, because <clears throat> no matter what you do, uh, you know, you, you feel as if you're living this almost like surreal lifestyle. And uh, it seems cool. And when the culture is there, you kind of get many things you know, that, that, that you're supposed to attract, you know, people from the opposite sex, right? That's attractive. You know, uh, you attract a lot of things that is supposed to be cool. But whenever that happens, there's a sense of something's wrong about what we're doing. And um, I don't really know how to change, but I want to change. But nobody will actually express that. Because if you express that, that means you're actually getting soft. You, you know what I mean? You're, you're considering something that you can't even figure out and nobody's figured it out, right? So when you feel that, you kind of suppress it and you hide it. And it's interesting because in Islam, uh, you know, to cover up that true nature is, is actually comes from the Arabic word kafara, you know, to, to hide basically. Uh, and, and, you know, this is what we attribute to a person who is not connected to God, right? Who doesn't know their true nature. So we may have the nature of wanting to connect with something we don't know if it's a higher power or if it's actually religion or philosophy because the way religions express to us it, it doesn't go according to our environment many times you know uh so even being catholic from a catholic background you know i respected always god and uh and i knew that he was basically watching and he could protect me but you know whenever you're dealing with situations uh you kind of just deal with your environment you know and, and you go with what's happening mm -hmm. and day to day you do certain things that you regret the next day, but it's like, oh, well, that's life. You know, you live to die, basically. There's no real sense of purpose. And so that does eat away. And I think I talked to a psychiatrist friend of mine, you know, I asked him, why do people take drugs and, you know, alcohol? F for me to understand why we did that in the past, even, he said it's because you have an illness or something you want to cure and you self-medicate. So I would say that, you know, taking drugs and all of that is kind of self-medicating, you know, an illness that you have from within. And, uh, and that's what was happening before. And uh, many people who are dealing with that, I mean, they could attest to that. Anybody who drinks and wakes up the next day, they know they're just not happy about what they did, you know, many times. Turning point. Now, what was the turning point in your life that you found out what the purpose of life is, why you're here in this world? When did that happen? Um, there, was a, there was a point in time uh, that was drastic for me and change. And that was the fact that my parents sent me back to Colombia, to South America, when I was 16 years old. Uh, I was coming down from a party one night, and uh, some individuals literally tried to take my life. 
and uh, I had to defend myself. And I didn't know if in the altercation people had gotten hurt um, and, and I, I could possibly even, you know, go to jail or something. So um, I, I came home bleeding and details left aside. Uh, you know, I told my parents what had happened and it was going to scale up from there. I mean, either they were, you know, next time they were truly gonna, going to kill me or the opposite was true. So they sent me to Colombia. And uh, in that period of time, it led me to think and ponder about life. And it's funny because people think Colombia is about cocaine and it's so, uh, you know, dangerous. I saw my life change in Colombia because it was so natural and the people were so good and welcoming and education was highlighted. Uh, I began to do very good in my grades. I was top of my class. Uh, I became an English teacher at the age of 16, which was unheard of. You know, uh, I, I had a very good job. I was making my own money and going to school and, and being very independent. I learned independence in Colombia. When I came back, I wanted that sort of lifestyle, uh, but it was tough in this environment. You know, eventually I kind of got sucked back into the environment, went back to partying, went back to doing certain things, not gangs, because that was like played out already. I was older, but I began to look into religion for answers. And uh, I was going to different temples. I went to the Buddhist temple, Hindu temple. Um, I, I, I went to uh, different churches you know, start analyzing why, why are they different Bibles. Um, and alhamdulillah, I mean, in the midst of all that search, you know, I found Islam. And uh, Islam came to me at a point in time where I really felt like, you know, I may die and I didn't, I didn't even know where I was going. And that used to eat away at me. And I used to think to myself, you know, why are we even here? I mean, just we live and die, amass some you know, material gain and just leave it, you know. So alhamdulillah, uh, after leaving a club, uh, with an individual that really wasn't practicing Islam that I grew up with. Um, he was looking at the, at the liquor that he was drinking and he said he couldn't believe he was doing that after having gone to Mecca. And I didn't even know what Mecca was. And when he explained to me, uh, I became very curious and he said, you can speak to my mother. She was a Christian nun and she became Muslim. And uh, from there on, I just went and spoke to her. She gave me a Quran. I started analyzing and reading and then I started seeing myself leaving habits. I didn't even want to go out anymore. I started uh, stopping my relationship with friends that I had that I knew were no good. And eventually when I embraced Islam, from that day on, I knew I never wanted to drink another drink in my life. I never wanted to smoke. I never wanted to hurt my body because I realized that it was a blessing, you know, to be able to see life from the perspective of Islam because it's like a lens that clarifies life for you. And so I started seeing the clarity of life and I said, this is what I've been looking for all my life. Now all I have to do is live up to it. And uh, Alhamdulillah, you know, all praise is due to Allah. When my parents saw the change, my father became Muslim three months later. Your father also accepted Islam. Yeah, he became Muslim at the age of 57. Uh, they thought nothing could change me, you know, yeah. in life. Uh, my girlfriend that looked into Islam with me at that point in time also became Muslim a week after. Uh, we got married a month after. Uh, my mother accepted Islam. Uh, about three years after my mother-in-law accepted Islam the day my first daughter was born. Uh, my little brother-in-law at the age of 16 years old accepted Islam. A lot of my gang rival, you know, people who I had problems with accepted Islam. The rivals, the ones the you rivals. were fighting with. Yeah. yeah, you know, so gangs, I mean, you know, September 11th hit three months after I became Muslim. I was asked to speak in front of the news in Spanish specifically and then in English and we saw throves of people becoming Muslim just because we're able to be straightforward about the information like this. Many people don't know about Islam, yeah. you know, and it's beautiful that a show like this can be able to, you know, uh, give this message, you know, to people. I mean, it's not, it's not a gimmick, mm -hmm. you know, this is not a, uh, it's like a get quick, uh, get rich quick scheme, you know, yeah. uh, religion sort of deal. This is real gradual change and, and it really builds character. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And we're going to be back and we're going to take some questions from our live studio audience here on The Dean Show. We'll be right back. I am not afraid to stand alone. I am not afraid to stand alone. If a lies by my side. I am not afraid to stand alone. I am not afraid to stand alone. If a lies by my side. I am not afraid to stand alone. I am not afraid to stand alone If a lie's by my side I am not afraid to stand alone
Hay solo un Dios. Adóralo a Él solo y, y no a su creación. I would go to my room, lock the door, prostrate and cry, saying, God, you know me better than myself. Show me the right way, and I will not look back. I will leave everything behind. Allah is our creator, and he creates everything, and he gives intelligence to people. Rasulullah is Muhammad, peace be upon him. Muhammad is one of the last messengers sent from God. Back here on the Dean Show, we'll take some questions from our live studio audience here. Uh, your question is, please, for Mujahid Fletcher. Go ahead. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Um, Brother Mujahid, you've done a lot of da'wah to people face-to-face. And uh, can you talk a little bit about the difference between doing da'wah face-to-face and doing it like electronically, you know, on something like the Dean Show? Islam in Spanish. Mashallah. So, appreciate it. So the question um, is about da'wah. Da'wah in, in, in the Arabic language means to call someone or invite someone to Islam. So, um, I, in, in dealing or engaging with people and um, speaking to them face to face, there's a lot of qualities that exist in regards to the people, the people's reaction regarding how you deliver the information, right? If I can see real quick. Excellent. Yeah. So how they're, they're wanting to see if you're anxious about what it is that you're saying. Are you like trying to sell them, pin them down, uh, defeat their arguments? You know, people really want to see if you're legitimately really care about them. If you're true and sincere of the fact that you want some good for them, it'll impact them way beyond any word that you even say. And that's not something that can even be expressed. It's only something that's felt. And when, when understanding that there's another human being and he has a soul, and that soul was created by the same creator that created you. And that soul is going to have to go back and answer in regards to what he or she did. Then now there's a higher respect for that individual. It's not even what he does or who he is, what color he is. It's way beyond that. So I think that deeper sense of, of dealing with each other as humans really helps on the, on the personal note. Now, when dealing with media, and uh, you know, I've been fortunate enough to, to study media and we, we utilize audio and video uh, multimedia, my field, interestingly enough, it's multiple ways of sending messages. That's what multimedia means. Uh, media is a way to communicate with people. Uh, sometimes people have an easier time sitting in front of YouTube, for example, or watching a video because it's less, uh, uh, what can I say, it's not going to hold them to account based on what they hear, right? So they, their guard is down. And also, they can't really argue based on emotions that they have. So if you say something about someone's way of life or someone's religion, they may actually feel that you're talking about their mother or their grandmother who taught them this. It's like, how dare you, you know? How dare you say my mother taught me what was wrong? That's the feeling. But, you know, when someone watches a video, they can't really argue about that. So they may be more susceptible to listening, analyzing. And if there's an email, if they email, all these emotions are out of the way because... You know, how much emotion can you put into an email and that sort of thing. So I think for different mediums, there are different styles of communication. And understanding those styles and understanding how to deliver the medium, uh, the message, is very powerful. Because now you have so many multiple ways of doing something. And uh, it's, it's beautiful. I mean, I think it all has its, its each perspective within, within wisdom, basically. How to utilize it. And we're going to go ahead and grab another question here from this young man here. How are you doing, young man? Alhamdulillah. How are you? Go ahead, man. <coughs> Brother Mujahid, we're glad that you're here. Um, Thank you. uh, my question is, uh, I understand that you probably looked at your past as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved you from that past. However, I can see that you probably see some positive things in your past that really benefited you right now uh, being a Muslim. And what are these things that you can pinpoint for us? That's a good question because um, we understand in Islam that basically there is a concept of destiny in Islam. And the concept of destiny is the fact that God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, He basically chooses for us only what is best. If we really understand uh, who He is, His decree has wisdom in it. So who knows? Maybe a lot of what I lived in the past led me to want to uh, connect myself more to him now. No telling if I wouldn't have lived the sort of experiences that I lived in the past, if I would have that sort of, you know, uh, a desire to do some good. Because some people ask me after I became Muslim, 
you know, I, you know, I started an organization called Islam in Spanish, uh, you know, started not only telling people about Islam, but trying to live Islam. Where Some people have said, where's that energy come from, you know, where do I get inspiration from sort of thing. And I, I would say that it's, it's like a catch-up game. I'm catching up because I, you know, I lost so many years of my life doing certain things. But then considering, I don't think it's a loss. It was, it was something that happened then that led me to want to know the truth. I wanted to know something that was straightforward. I, I didn't like people telling me things that they didn't even, you know, people just give opinions about life, right? Like everybody knows what's best for you. I, I started not liking to follow human beings. But if you don't follow human beings, how are you going to live, right? And so I was like, I pushed that out of the way. But why did I know that? Because of so many experiences that, that I had. Uh, loyalty, brotherhood, all of these things that we were talking about in gang culture. When looking at Islam and becoming a Muslim, you gain true brotherhood. Now you love one another for the sake of, you know, the one who created you. Brotherhood, now in the Muslim community with the affinity that we worship one God. And in society in general is a sense of brotherhood because of, you know, we're humans. So it's a sense of brotherhood in humanity. So now these notions that I learned, you know, and, and the sort of difficulties or obstacles I faced, the things that urged me to, to, to want to kind of obtain a higher sense of living, I found it in Islam. So, I mean, loyalty, truthfulness, uh, you know, a sense of, of family, like, like a human family. I mean, we find Muslims come from all over the world. And I don't think I would have known so many people from so many different backgrounds and colors and languages if I wasn't a Muslim. Because when you're not Muslim, you only kind of hold to your own. So there, there's so much, I mean, that I benefited from in not being Muslim and living the lifestyle that I live that, uh, that, that encouraged me now more and more to be able to, uh, you know, seek out those things as a human being that I found in Islam. On the outside, everything looks good. You see the $100,000 cars, you see a lot of diamonds, you see a lot of females, and they think that this is, you know, this is a life. This is, this is like, you know, paradise right here on earth. It's not anyone's job to go into someone's heart and change their heart. Your job is to tell people what the truth is. And the reality of it is, while we're sitting here, while I'm sitting here constantly paying for the disease, the cure was free. For the people out there, because we love our brothers in humanity, and everybody has the potential to submit to the Creator alone without any associates, without any partners. This is what Islam is calling you to do. It's calling you to submit to the one God and to do good, to do righteousness. But some people have many misconceptions. So just in short, how do you deal with it? Because you're out there, you're inviting people to purpose, to reflect about the purpose of life. You're giving them the invitation. But some people, they feel, look, Islam is barbaric. Islam is about oppressing women. Islam is backwards. What do you say to them? You know, with, with anything in life, uh, if you want to judge, uh, you have to go to the source of what you're trying to judge. And uh, I was keen on wanting to know about Islam based on the sources of Islam. So anyone who is saying anything about Islam, they need to check their sources first and foremost. And whenever people say something about Islam and they say something like it's barbaric or is this or is that, I always question and ask them, how do you know? Where did you get that information from? And the majority of the times they'll say, from the news. And so based on the news, if it was true always, then uh, I should be selling drugs because I'm Colombian. Yeah. Right? <laughs> That's who I'm supposed to be, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and all that. And there's stereotypes for every sort of you know, demographic and people. But it's so superficial. You know, when people want to be real about something, they need to research and they need to study and they need to ask people who are qualified in whatever it is, right? If you want to uh, fix your car, you know, you don't just go and, you know, follow someone's advice who doesn't even understand the principle of that concept. You go to a specialist. You know, in Islam, we have people who are qualified, we have people of knowledge, basically. And I remember going to a mosque and asking questions the same way I went to a Buddhist monk. You know, and, and all that. I think people need to be more uh, open to dealing with people who are different than them. And uh, if people want to embrace a sense of, of, of change within themselves, they have to begin by expanding the realm of, of, of research. You know, if, if some people are always like, whatever I think is, is right. For those sort of people, I mean, what can you do? Mm -hmm. They can read possibly. But 
if people read and then go and find out who the Muslims are, anybody who finds a Muslim and understands who a Muslim is based on his attitude, his character, will understand that, I mean, we're human beings. We all make mistakes, right? Not, not going to say that, you know, there's not Muslims that are, uh, you know, doing things that are wrong. I mean, there's Christians that are doing things that are wrong and, and Buddhists because, you know, that's human beings. But we don't blame religion on that. We blame the individual possibly for having some shortcomings. So uh, people should research about Islam. And when they find what Islam has to offer based on the two sources, which is the book, the Quran, which is a final revelation sent from the creator of the heavens and the earth, confirming the Bible, the Old Testament, the Psalms of David, the Psalms of, uh, you know, so many, you know, Abraham. It's a confirmation of all the scriptures. And then when they want to know how to implement that book, we look at the example of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, which is, you know, brothers with Jesus and Moses and Abraham and Ismail and all of them, they're brothers in faith, in the same faith. None of them came to tell people other than there's only one God and none has the right to be worshipped except him alone. Follow me. Every single one of them are to be followed. And if we follow them, we'll find that they never pray to anything other than the Creator. And so I think for sincere people that really question about life, Islam is um, by far, I mean, you know, the best option. But they have to discover that on their own because nobody can do that for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's only through God's guidance. And I'd recommend people to really and sincerely be true to themselves and ask the Creator to guide them to whatever is the truth, regardless of what it's called, regardless of what color it comes in, and who practices it. And if a person is sincere in that way, we have total confidence that, you know, whoever uh, the Creator of the heavens and the earth guides, nobody can lead them astray. And whoever is led astray, none can guide other than Him. So they have to entrust in Him first and foremost. We're getting a signal that we're almost out of time. I just got to get one more in. The person says, you know what, I, I'm a good person and I believe in God, but I just don't want to follow any organized religion. I'm a person of science. What do you have to say? Have you heard this? Yes, for sure. Most definitely. A lot of times there's blanket statements like that because the person is possibly avoiding something that they saw that they didn't like from a religion, right? Uh, so I remember um, looking at the aspect, for example, in Catholicism, right? It doesn't make sense to me, for example, if I say if Catholicism is an organized religion, the, th the very thought that the most purest of women become nuns, those are the good women, they become nuns, meaning they can't marry, okay, because they're pure, they gave their life to God. Then you have the purest of men, they become priests, right, the best men, and they can't marry. So logically you analyze and you say, well, the only people reproducing are the bad people. How does that make sense? I don't like organized religion then. You understand? I'd rather just like at random, good people and bad people mix better than just, you know, bad people not mix. Yes. You understand? So if people see this sort of thing from a religion, then obviously. But whenever you look at Islam, it has so much order that any human being will feel like, I'm glad I finally found order. Mm -hmm. uh, science can give you facts about the creation, but that creation has a creator. And the creator can explain in context from his perspective what the creation is not only scientific facts of the material realm but things that are deeper and signs so that people can ponder about another life that is beyond this one and when you know there's so many parables about creation uh, you know the grass basically we all see it die and then we see that it comes back up you know when it has water and everything these are signs of like a human being who dies and then he goes on to live again you know, afterwards in another life. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at Islam, we look at the creation and we see the signs, you know, and Allah mentions many times in verses, uh, and basically the men who ponder, you know, men, this is clear signs of, for men who, uh, you know, who ponder, who, men of understanding, you know, men who contemplate. So this sort of reasoning, uh, you know, has to be instilled in a human being voluntarily. Many people have this involuntarily and they just hide it and they don't want to seek answers. For the person who wants to seek answers, Islam is, is by far, I mean, you know, the best choice. And I tried looking everywhere and tried, tried to, everywhere. I tried to negate Islam as much as I tried to negate every other religion. And I had to literally, after like one year of researching about Islam, trying to find the negative side or the problem with it, uh, you know, I just gave up. And that's what Islam means. It means to surrender. It's like when you give up. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, I give up, I can't. Yeah. You know, it's like you try to throw stones and you can't hit it. And so, I, you know, that's when you submit and you say, you know, uh, Allah is the only one worthy of worship. Muhammad is a messenger. 
And this way of life basically is the way of life for all human beings uh, that is pleasing to God on the day that we stand in front of Him basically after our death uh, to be able to be given either uh, another life which is way better than this one which is paradise or uh, be punished for the fact that we didn't do what we were supposed to do which is the hellfire. And we always seek refuge in God basically from uh, this notion of ending up in the ladder in the hellfire because it's a place nobody wants to go. And if people deny that, they may do it now, but it will come a time where it will be, it'll be a reality. And so all these books that were sent down and all these messengers that were sent throughout time was to inform people. And there will be people who will accept and there will be others that don't. So we also have to have tolerance basically for you know, every human being and their choices. But we can only give the, the, the information basically. And we're entrusted with that. Uh, due to the fact that after the Prophet Muhammad, we understand, peace be upon him, there will be no other messenger sent to humanity. So it's unto people like yourself, myself, and many of, of the people who have understood their message to share it with humanity. And uh, after that, you know, Allah will guide whomsoever He wills. In the last minute that we have, tell us a little bit about uh, your organization, how people can get in contact with you to learn more, to get involved. Excellent. Um, Alhamdulillah, I was fortunate to, uh, to be the founder of an organization called Islam in Spanish. Islam in Spanish? Yes, and the website is islaminspanish.org. Uh, this is for Latinos or people who speak the Spanish language because I saw that there was a void. Uh, there wasn't even material when we embraced Islam. Alhamdulillah, we have the Quran now in 26 CDs that we've produced. Uh, much of the information that exists in the Arabic language and even in English, we have basically now in Spanish worldwide. So we, we dedicated that for a group of individuals that didn't really have the message. And we've seen hundreds of people, mashallah, embrace Islam because of that. But then now also that led on to being able to um, establish a place locally here in the Houston area called the Andalusia Social and Educational Media Center. And the website for that is andalusiacenter.org. And this center uh, is kind of a hub for us to be able to deal with a lot of the people who we've been dealing with over a period of years, which is the youth. Uh, people who are new to Islam, who are making the transition into Islam, uh, Latino communities. We do a television show there now for Islam in Spanish. Uh, we benefit people through workshops and so on. And, uh, and, and, and basically people who are not Muslim. You know, they need a, a place that is not necessarily a mosque or a place that is a religious setting. Uh, they need a, a social setting, you know, so that they can go be themselves, but at the same time interact with people uh, like ourselves who, who are Muslim. And we can dialogue and, you know, we have film screenings. Uh, there was a PlayStation 3 tournament happening today with the youth uh, and, and many things that are social, but always within the context of the good and a positive message always involved. So, alhamdulillah, this is a, a, you know, a new project uh, that we hope basically to do shows like this. Uh, alhamdulillah, we had you uh, today and I interviewed you, alhamdulillah, there at the Andalusia Center. Uh, you know, and we, we hope to be able to produce films, uh, short films right now. This is kind of a next project for myself as an individual. I love to produce meaningful films that show uh, life-changing moments and turning points so that people can be inspired uh, to be able to reason and question about life. Sometimes leading them to look into Islam, look into themselves, you know, a lot deeper and so on. So now we have a whole production studio. Hakim Elijuan is one of our supporters uh, and, and, and many others. I mean, the Muslim community in Houston has been great. Mm -hmm. And people all over the world, Yusuf Estes, as you know, and, and, and many others. You mentioned Muhammad Adli. There's many good people who have done work that really their prayers and their support and networks and everything, I mean, have really helped us. And we're working with the city of Houston as well, Interfaith Ministries, uh, dealing with people of different religions. I mean, there's a lot going on. And uh, this project literally has just kicked off maybe about two months ago. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we hope, uh, you know, that Allah blesses it to, to be a source of good, you know, for humanity in general. And may you continue with the wonderful work you're doing. May God Almighty Allah reward you. Thank I mean, you so much for being with I us. Mean, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I just, thank and you. may Allah bless you for your work. I mean, you too. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you out there. I hope you got to benefit from Mujahid's story. And I hope that you continue to tune in here to The Dean Show. And if you want to learn more about Islam, call the number on the screen, 1-800-662-ISLAM. Pick up a verbatim, the verbatim Word of God, the Quran. Read it today. And we will see you next time. We started with peace. We end with peace. Until next time, peace be unto you.